والآن إلى إلى محاضرة نحو نماذج عملية للقرن الواحد وعشرين في القيادة والابتكار globally in inclusive leadership both leadership and innovation this lecture will be held by Dr. Lisa Coleman please come from New York University Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon. As was said, my name is Lisa Coleman, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation at New York University. And I'm just going to get started. Let's see. No slides? My slides aren't loaded. Just one minute? Okay. My slides are being loaded up uh, momentarily. So I will say a few things about um, my first slide so that we, um, I can just talk a little bit about what I'm gonna talk about. S um, New York University is the largest private institution in the United States. That means that we have about 80,000 people with whom we work on a daily basis. We have campuses in a uh, portal campuses in Abu Dhabi, a portal campus in Shanghai, and 13 campuses across the world in places like Sydney, Ghana, Paris, London, etc. So we are also the most international institution in the United States, meaning that we have the most um, international campuses, but the most international exchange uh, considered the most, in the, uh, as I said, in the, in the United States is contrasted to our other institutions. The other facts about NYU are that we are also the, um, the largest private research institution. In other words, we are a research one institution, meaning that we produce, obviously, uh, research, but also we outpace, and I think this is part of what I'll be talking about today, we outpace MIT, Harvard, and Princeton combined in terms of our production of businesses and startups. We're the number one institution in the United States to produce entrepreneurship businesses. We have the largest social innovation labs as well as the la largest, um, uh, excuse me, um, excuse me, entrepreneurship labs. Sorry, there's a little bug. Uh, entrepreneurship labs as well as the largest labs for female entrepreneurs, which I will also talk about in just a moment. In terms of social innovation, one of the things that we're trying to do at NYU is to really think about multi-sector partnerships and how we move beyond sort of the rote partnerships that we've been engaged in historically. And so as soon as I get my slides, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the partnerships and some of the ways that we've been delving into this idea of social innovation, but also the ways in which we've been enacting it um, and the kinds of things that we consider in terms of our research. So let me try again with the slides. No.
maybe I, hold on one second, one moment. Apologies for the technical difficulties. It seems my slides haven't been loaded, but they're on their way. So let me um, just say a little bit more about New York University. And so as I was talking, I should say a little bit about the work that I do at NYU. I work for the president of NYU, uh, Anthony Hamilton. In this role, I work with our deans, our senior leaders, to advance inclusion, but also to advance innovation efforts. As I was saying, we have the largest female founders labs, and we also have the largest um, production of business at NYU in terms of B2B. The second area that we also have are the largest venture capitalists in terms of investments in those businesses of any institution also in the United States. As I begin this talk, I would like to also say that we, if we think about the ways in which innovation has um, begun, excuse me, I'm pulling up my, uh, innovate my slides so I can see them as they get loaded. There are three areas right now as we think about the ways in which innovation is growing. The tech sector is one of the obvious sectors and really thinking about tech and, and, the, and of course with the new infusion of chat, GM, chat, chat GPT and of course the metaverse. Also as we think about the disruptions, what we, all, disruptions, what we also know is automation and thinking about this, what is being automated in the current, excuse me, ecosystem and landscape. And then lastly is the transformation of data. As we think about the transformation of data, and also I did not say this when I was speaking about NYU, we're also part of the largest data center in the United States, which is actually located in New York City. As we continue our work, we're also aligning our work with the sustainable development goals, and particularly thinking about access to education, and of course, um, eliminating and thinking about equity deliver equitable deliverable processes. The, when we think about the digital uh, growth that is happening across the world, yes, thank you. Uh, all right, there we are. So that's New York University. That's what I was talking about being the most international university. And then the, this is actually where I, was, where I was, was talking about some of the disruptors in terms of thinking about the disruptions currently that are happening across, uh, across all sectors. And then I had just gotten here, so we're right on time, is um, thinking about the sustainable development goals, and in particular, thinking about equitable education, and then of course, uh, as I said, then talking about, speaking about equity across all sectors. As we look at digital growth markets, and as we think about the ways in which digitization is happening, we are spending an inordinate amount of time. We just created a new makerspace at NYU to reimagine what will the digital world look like, particularly as we think about increased access for members of various populations. The other piece um, is to re are coordinating and collaborating and thinking about transgenerational opportunities. And when I say transgenerational, I'm gonna talk just in a moment about different generations and what's happening across the generations. When we look at, and particularly in higher education and in the United States, we do not have a retirement age. So we have people in higher education who are 
60 plus and in that range who are many of our professors. Um, and then we also have, of course, um, our students, and our students go all the way to the ages of 14. So what I like to say is in the workforce, we may be working with five, four or five generations, but certainly in higher education, we're working with six to seven on any given day. As a result, what we know is that we have opportunities to work across these generations, and these are the kinds of efforts that we're making at NYU currently. What we know is that baby boomers, the silent generation, all the way down to the alphas look very different. From Gen Z, um, excuse me, from Gen X, then we get to the millennials, then of course Gen Z, and the alphas which are born today, uh, in college today. What we know about those individuals is that they are much more innovative, they are much more entrepreneurial, and they are interested in moving, and this is across regions, in entrepreneurship opportunities as well as intrapreneurship opportunities, which mean providing uh, entrepreneurial opportunities within companies and organizations. These, uh, this growth, if we think about what's happening with generations, we know that 36% of the global workforce, right, is already Gen Z. And as we, as we grow, uh, if we think about the millennials, that's over 75% of the workforce. 65% of children entering uh, the workforce, entering school today, will not have, there are jobs that are not available to them. In other words, the jobs do not exist, and those jobs will emerge over time. I say this about myself. I am a person who, the job that I hold today did not exist 20 years ago. There were no officers like me in higher education in the United States 20 years ago. And so as a result, we're seeing a shift in markets, but also a shift in what consumers, particularly consumers of higher education, but consumers in the workforce uh, will want. And part of that, if you look at what, uh, if you look at this slide, you can see data science, but of course, uh, you have the millennial generational experts, big data architects, and of course, UX designers. But this doesn't even begin to describe when we think about automation, of course, increased digitization, and of course, um, other areas of tech. Next, as we see here, and this is part of what the new generation and future workers are interested in, is this idea of a collaborative revolution. We have, and this work comes um, out of Deloitte and McKinsey, we have left what is called the um, sort of industrial or information revolution, and we're now in the collaboration or information revolution. So in other words, gathering information and innovating is central to the work. So if we think about collaboration workers and data science programs, collaboration will mean more companies that is, will be based on their success or their lack of success. In other words, if you're able to collaborate, you'll be sustainable in ways that you would not. And I hear what I use the example, many of us are familiar with the Uber. If Uber had partnered with the taxi industries across the world, and, or the taxi industries had partnered with Uber, the taxi industries might have sustained themselves in much better ways, but as we see, the disruption to the market. So this idea of collaboration, this idea of coming across different industries becomes crucial when we're thinking about sustainability of our companies and organizations. The global higher education trends, what we're seeing is increased education globally. And when I say this, it's not just access to uh, typical higher education, but also certifications, global certification trends. We're seeing certifications in um, things like chat GBT, certifications in data science, et cetera. And we will see the inc uh, increased growth of those kinds of markets moving forward. And those, again, are global trends. As we continue to look at the global centers of the world, what we know is that those global centers, many of them are not inside the United States. And as we think about the global centers of innovation and the collaborations there, we can then begin to think about the ways in which there's global market growth. I wanna spend just a couple minutes on this slide here, which is really talking about where the growth is located. So if we think about the metaverse, I actually spent a, Great deal of time working with Meta. They're actually, as you know, um, moved from Facebook to Meta. And I just was actually working with them and thinking about 
What will this metaverse look like? And how do we ensure that the global considerations um, as we develop the metaverse are thinking about equity? Importantly, what we know about the metaverse and the changes to um, what we're seeing in terms of the next steps is that the ways in which we envision the literal and real world are shifting. In other words, the ways in which people will experience artificial intelligence will shape the ways that they experience all kinds of new products, from robotics, obviously, but more importantly to the ways in which those interventions will change our uh, transportation systems and also change the ways in which we live inside our homes. In other words, the ways in which we have access to technology inside our homes. The next piece in terms of, and I know I'm going quickly, um, but I wanna make sure I get to a couple of, uh, couple of things. If we think about the tourism, and we think about tourism across places like the UAE, et cetera, and the MENA regions, what we know is that whether it's UAE or in the MENA regions, and you'll see there, I have a, a number of statistics about tourism. All, the reason I'm bringing this up is because what we're seeing is increased global tourism, which also means this integration of innovation um, is happening at an accelerated rate because of the global ways in we're, which we're interconnected. The global trends today, as we see in this slide right here, and really thinking about renewable energy, we also know that the shift to, to solar in energy is moving very quickly, and this is also an innovation possibility as we think of, of the move from certain kinds of economies to solar economies. The MENA region um, is set by the end of 2025, and we know that this is an area of tremendous growth, outpacing much of the Western world. The other area of possibility for innovation, and we're seeing this across a number of different countries and organizations, is this work with people on the disability or people of determination spectrum, particularly those people with autism and uh, Asperger's as their talents are really central to thinking about particularly digital growth and digitization. We're seeing companies like SAP in Germany, uh, Home Depot in the United States, um, begin to hire people with disabilities at accelerated rates because of their talents, particularly in this digital and this digitization market. Women in the MENA region and really thinking about uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. One of the um, things that I like to bring out here is that the, if we were to really think about um, harnessing the energy of women and particularly women entrepreneurs, we, this is a trillion dollar industry. And then, of course, as we think about the growth in the MENA region, such incredible possibilities. And also what we know is that in many countries in the MENA region, unlike in the Western world in the United States, women are outpacing or equal to men in, st in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, which also gives great possibilities to think about partnership, but also the growth with girls, particularly, um, and we're seeing that with new generations uh, emerging leaders and girls focused on science, technology, engineering, and math, and the possibilities for collaboration is vast, particularly as we think about growth markets. Uh, again, this is just a slide to talk about sort of the emerging women leaders and sort of the, the desires which map on to the desires of emerging generations. One of the things that I will say is emerging generations have new desires for their workforce, uh, very different than their, uh, than, um, older generations in many, many ways. And these are global trends again. Um, as we think, and this is what I was just saying in terms of if we were to uh, really think about the uh, employment across the MENA region, uh, we would see as much as $2.0 trillion in terms of increase in terms of the economic benefits. Um, this is, um, lastly, I'm gonna go through these last slides just pretty quickly here as I finish up my presentation to really think about organizational cultures and how do we begin to think about asset modeling. And really, when, when I say asset modeling, this is built on the work of a, a person by the name of Scott Page. Scott Page writes a book that's really about how do we use the bonuses um, that we find from various forms of diversification, whether that be uh, people from across generations, women, et cetera, and how do we begin to look at those as assets and really think about the assets in our companies and our organizations, and that will lead to, obviously, sustainable growth, strategy, and then really thinking about embedding. 
Um, we use a design thinking model in our work, and that design thinking model is embedded in social innovation. Many of you are familiar with it, and that is at the bottom of the slide, um, really thinking about how do we test and pilot our work. And I will say this is part of the work of our female founders lab, was to really begin to test that work and to think about um, what we're doing next. Our, our work is really action-oriented and adaptive, and we're thinking about reflective leadership. And of course, as we um, begin to think about our work, particularly in the Arab region, which as I said, we're located in the UAE, and then really thinking about how are we working with our youth in that region, um, what we know, and as you can see here, 73% uh, safe and security, 70% education, healthcare, and the focus of, we work with schools in the Arab region as well, and so really thinking about how do we double down on these priorities, but also make sure that as we begin to think about these growth markets, how are we ensuring that, that innovation in our work with youth is prioritized, and how we do that is through our networking, physical, and economic assets, and we advance our work through four areas, people policies, programs, and resources, and um, our people focus is really on this multi-generational work. So I'm gonna give a couple of quick examples of some of the multi-generational work that we started to do. One is we've developed a platform where we're bringing teenagers and older people together to work on technology projects where older people are learning from younger people about how to use technology utilize new technologies. We have an aging center at our campus at NYU, and of course, we have our veterans campuses, our veterans center as well, and then partnering with our faculty to actually showcase this work. It's actually lead, leading to all kinds of, and what we've been calling these are our incubation labs, and these incubation labs have allowed multi-generational partnerships in ways that have um, actually allowed us to do, and this is part of the reason that we've actually got the largest uh, female founders group in the United States as part of this work comes out of bringing those communities together. In this work, what we've done is think about collaboration and partnerships, innovation and sustainability, and bringing our research together uh, to bear upon this work. I'll give you one other concrete example in terms of the partnership work that we have created, and this is about partnerships um, across institutions. We also have some partnerships outside of the United States, particularly in, excuse me, South Africa and Tanzania, where we started to work on water projects and thinking about salination and bringing um, our youth together in that work as well. This is focused on innovation and sustainability, and as we know, many of our youth are very focused on sustainability and thinking about the planet. Uh, again, I already mentioned our makerspace and the work that we're doing in terms of that work. Uh, this is where I was talking about in terms of our incubators. We have our NYU hackathon, and of course, uh, we in, 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 and then of course we put our design thinking model into place there. I'm going to end um, by just talking a little bit here about our digital summit and the work that we've done with our Ur Urban Future Labs. Uh, as we think about our global workplace market, what we're really thinking about here is telecommunication. We have retail. We're thinking about healthcare, manufacturing, and government. And with our School of Engineering, we have begun to really then move into these areas of telecommunication, and then with our School of Global Public Health to think about innovations and incubations in the space of public health. We recently just had a hackathon with our schools, uh, and this is one of the most interesting things that happened in terms of thinking about um, emerging generations. During the hackathon, we had a group of 17-year-olds create a new app. The app was a healthcare app to recognize melanoma on your skin. What they did was they took their cell phones and loaded about 80,000 images of moles into their technology, and they were able to create an app where you can use the app to scan the mole on your skin. It can tell you whether or not it may be right, may have some form of melanoma, you can send it to your doctor and immediately get information. When we saw 17-year-olds, and I, it was 14 to 17-year-olds, creating this kind of new technology, this is when we knew that this kind of work and bringing together generations would lead to new kinds of explorations, but also allow us as an institution 
to move forward very quickly. And as you can imagine, um, this is the kind of work that we've really we've ha have explored greatly. And it's also allowed us, even in our school of dentistry, our school of nursing, to advance our work in terms of technology and patient care, in particular, thinking about these emerging technologies um, through the development of whether it's hackathons or our, our lab experimentation. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we're, we are um, having multi-sector partnerships. Our multi-sector partnerships are all across the board, whether that's faith communities, parks, uh, youth and students, and of course, even transportation systems, as we are located, obviously, in, in New York City and some of the central locations in the world. Um, I'll end with this slide, and I think I'm out of time, so it's perfect. I'm really thinking about New York University, and what we really think about is how are we gonna be agile for the future, and of course, remain in a state of dynamism that's nimble, and we do this through sustainability, focusing on our gender issues, focusing on our founders and our maker spaces, and that is me. Thank you so much, I appreciate your time. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Lisa. The content was uh, highly appreciated and we enjoyed all the part of the lecture. Well, <coughs> <coughs> <coughs>